All right, let's uh, let's jump right in. I want to make sure Min has as much time as possible to do his session. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the strategic roadmap building for your email program. Min uh, Min is a long term friend of mine. Uh, we worked together for a number of years, um, and uh, you know some of the stuff that Min has done in his career has been fantastic. But I think you know getting his uh, his MBA in the last year or two, um, you know, I think is really going to allow Min to take his thinking and his strategic thought for marketing in, in general to the next level. And I'm really glad that Min has decided to share some of that, you know, strategic thought and strategic roadmap building that uh, he's learned over the years with the group here. So uh, Min, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna come back right near the end uh, for some Q&A. So everyone, please put your questions in the chat uh, and we will uh, get to them. Uh, either Min will get to them as he goes or we'll get to them at the end. So Min, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. We'll get to the question uh, at the end. Uh, the only reason I'm here is because I'm a friend of Matt. I'm pretty sure about that. So uh, again, thanks for the introduction, Matt. Uh, a little bit about myself. For the past uh, 20 years, uh, digital strategy, digital marketing, specifically email marketing, have uh, defined my uh, professional life. And uh, beyond just the MBA that uh, Matt uh, just uh, shared, what I do want to share is some tips that I've acquired over the past uh, 20 years that have allowed me to identify new campaign ideas, uh, take existing programs to the next level, and actually, and this is really important, actually make these ideas real. Uh, it's so disappointing when you are so excited about an idea and it never uh, happens. So how can you make these ideas uh, real? Uh, the ideas, the, the concepts that I'm going to be sharing with you, they work across any uh, organization, any vertical, small businesses uh, to large uh, enterprise. They are pretty much fundamental uh, concepts and they are proven concepts that, again, that I've used over the past uh, 20 years, and I'm excited to, to share them uh, with you. One of the things uh, to note is that this session is going to be a practical hands-on session. So as I'm walking through these tips, try, try to apply them to your own organizational situation. And my hope is by the end of this uh, session, you'll be able to identify two or three, uh, perhaps even more, um, uh, concepts that you'll get really excited about. So uh, to get started, what we're going to do is I'm going to just make a couple of observations about our world as email marketers. Uh, I think we should uh, discuss uh, uh, them uh, very quickly. Again, had uh, opportunities to work with many different organizations. And my general sense is that these organizations, small and large, spend a lot of time, a great deal of time, perfecting their email program, developing them, launching uh, them. And what we usually find is that these programs rarely evolve. Uh, email marketers, I understand it, I'm one. Email marketers, we're busy. And in, uh, in times like this, uh, we're stretched particularly thin. So. It, you know, the concept or the idea is if the email program isn't broken, uh, it's just easier to just let it uh, run, right? And so with many email programs out there today, there is this mentality of you set it and then you forget it. But we need to break through that uh, mentality. And I'm, I'm hoping some of the methodology framework will allow us to break uh, that through. So what are our problem as email marketers? Uh, some of the problems that we have. Um, you know, we're not happy. We know this. I'm not happy. You're not happy of the fact that there's this mentality of you said it and forget it. We're incredibly proud uh, people. Uh, our organization expect and we expect better of ourselves as well. We expect to be able to deliver uh, results, better results year after year. Uh, we expect to do it better, faster, and cheaper, and we're constantly trying to find innovation, and there's an expectation from our organization that we're going to be finding innovation. But because of our day-to-day -day routine and our set it and forget it uh, nature of uh, email program, it is sometimes difficult to constantly find new ways to innovate and take your program to the next uh, level. So that's the problem that we're going to try to solve uh, today. How can we make it easier 
to uh, find innovation and evolve our program. Wouldn't it be great if we had a machine that just churned these new ideas uh, out uh, for us? And uh, by applying some of these methodology, uh, I'm hoping that uh, would be as close uh, to that as possible. So what are we gonna cover? We're gonna cover three things. Uh, actually, we're gonna cover four uh, frameworks that falls in under these uh, three buckets. I'm going to walk you through uh, a few uh, items. The very first item that I'm going to uh, go through is uh, to discuss value. Innovation, at the heart of innovation, is delivering value. So uh, th there's nothing more important than uh, delivering value to our subscriber, to our members, to our customers. So. Uh, what we're going to do here is we are going to explore two frameworks that's going to keep us as email marketers accountable on delivering this uh, critical uh, point. So again, first, we're going to talk about value. After talking about value, we're then going to talk, uh, we're going to then uh, take a look at operation. We're going to talk about operational excellence. We're going to touch specifically on data flows. And the fact that poor data flow continues to be the primary hurdle that prevents us as an email marketer from, uh, you know, evolving our program and taking it to, to the next level. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use a framework that will allow us to audit our uh, data uh, flow and uh, allow us to identify what else we can do with our existing data. Not, no big investment in big data, but with our existing data, what can we do to make in, uh, impactful change uh, immediately? And then uh, finally, we're going to end with the execution part. The key thing to note is part one and part two, they are the fundamentals. Some of you have uh, probably have already done uh, the, the work. So if you've uh, done the work, uh, then uh, you know, congratulations. Uh, so, uh, but if you have not uh, done the work uh, yet, I think it's pretty critical that you do this, uh, these work uh, first, because it's going to make uh, execution so much uh, easier. And with execution, what we're going to looking, what we're going to be looking at is a repeatable action plan, something that will evolve uh, with the organization. This is going to be the the idea generating um, a machine that's going to allow you to constantly have uh, new ideas, new innovation uh, in the current quarter, uh, in the next quarter, and into uh, the next year. So that is going to be our agenda for uh, the next um, few minutes. To help us uh, through some of the framework and better understand them, I'm going to use a recent experience. Um, over the, the summer, uh, uh, there was a nonprofit uh, that uh, a nonprofit association that reached out to me and uh, they were asking for help. And so I was more than happy to volunteer my time uh, with them. I'm still helping uh, them. Uh, the association, this nonprofit association was concerned about decreasing membership uh, engagement. Uh, to be quite honest, when I looked at the, the situation and when I looked at the data, it was a, uh, it was a problem before COVID. COVID uh, unfortunately made it uh, worse. Uh, COVID has made everything uh, worse. Uh, that being said, they suspected that one of the primary reasons why there was lower or decreasing membership engagement was that they thought that their email program was stale. And they thought that if we, if they could just uh, rejuvenate their email program, that uh, amazing things will happen with uh, engagement. So they asked me uh, to help them uh, update, uh, update their program. Uh, the other thing that they were also asking me to do was to look into the, the platform, or, or sorry, to look into new platforms uh, that had new feature. And they thought that uh, by migrating to a new platform might help uh, uh, rejuvenate uh, their membership uh, list as well. And what I can tell you is that from my experience and most likely from your experience as well, is that if you're concerned with the performance of your email program, uh, it is usually not the, the technology or the people. Uh, the root cause is usually due to the fact that you have simply not unlocked the true value of your organization and of your offering. And this is what we're gonna try to do today. Uh, and, or actually right now, 
how do we find how do we find the true value of your uh, organization? Now, this was touched upon in an earlier um, uh, panel um, uh, discussion uh, that was uh, moderated by uh, Dan Murphy. And when he was talking about uh, CRM and the importance of being customer uh, centric, it all starts and it all ends with your subscriber. So having a command of what motivates them, having a command of what drives them is gonna be absolutely key in delivering an experience that's gonna delight them and it's gonna increase their engagement. So our fundamental North Star right now is you need to know your subscriber. And if you're able to know your subscriber, then you could do uh, really wonderful things. And so that's how we started, or at least how I started with the nonprofit. What I did was I asked them, hey, can I, can I look at some of your data? Can I interview some of your members? Can I talk to some of uh, your team? I want to know more about your members. I want to know about more about your subscriber. And what we discovered through that exercise, and you're going to be uh, very familiar with this, is the concept of persona. And they had uh, three types of persona. They had the young and ambitious junior marketer just starting off with uh, their career. They had the mid-level marketer uh, uh, looking uh, to their next uh, stage in their career. And they had very senior uh, marketers, experienced leader, uh, wanting to give back. And so with these persona, the question again is, what drives them? What motivates them? The, the data suggests and the interview suggests that, you know, they were driven and motivated by wanting to learn more, wanting to connect and wanting uh, to grow. And each of them had a, a slightly different flavor as to what learning meant to them, what connecting mean to them and what uh, growing uh, meant for them. And so by understanding who they are, by understanding their motivation and what drives them, we can now put ourselves into their shoes. And this leads us to the first framework. Framework number one is the empathy map. Uh, and what we want to do with empathy map, again, is put ourselves in their shoes. So with, uh, with any organization, uh, any organization, there are going to be generally three stage uh, to an engagement. Uh, people are going to be searching uh, for you. They're going to be considering you. So this is the, the search and uh, select a stage. People are then going to uh, engage with you. And what is often uh, forgotten uh, or ignored is the post engagement stage, right? So First, let's identify the stage. This is pretty common. And for each stage, there are sub-stages, there are sub-phases. So in this particular scenario, in this particular use case, for the search and select stage, there were three sub-stages. First, you know, we have to consider as a marketer, uh, junior marketer, for example, and I'm putting myself in their shoe, uh, my question is, how do I en enhance my careers? Uh, what options are there? Uh, if I'm interested in joining this organization, how do I join? You know, these are some of the, the, the questions that I'm asking myself. Uh, once we define the stage or once you define the stage, and to be quite honest, this is pretty standard across all organization. The next thing that you want to do is you're going to ask three questions. The first question is, what are these member do members doing or what are your customers doing? Uh, what are your subscriber doing? And you're going to, for every single one of these states, you're going to list exactly what uh, you believe based on uh, feedback from them or, um, or your own knowledge, what they're uh, currently doing. So for people, for example, who are trying to enhance their career, they're going to join uh, or update their LinkedIn profile. They're going to find networking opportunities. They're going to learn uh, uh, seek training opportunities and mentorship uh, opportunity. Uh, once they're ready to join uh, an association, you know, they might have to fill out an application. They might need to pay some fees. So what, again, what you're trying to do is identify all the various tasks that uh, they might be doing for these uh, stages. Next, you're going to ask yourself, what are these members or what are these customers or what are these uh, subscribers? What are they thinking? 
So, for example, if I'm, you know, want to enhance my career, I might be thinking, well, where do I start? What is the right option for me? There's so many options. What are the right option for me? If I'm exploring all of these options, my next question might be, how much is this is going to cost? Uh, do I have time to to uh, commit uh, to this? And when I'm ready to uh, join an organization, I know what the costs are. My next question might be, how how can I find a way for someone else to pay this for me? Is there a way that my work can subsidize this? You know, these are some of the thoughts that are uh, going through uh, the the heads of a potential uh, member. The last question that you're going to ask is what are these uh, folks, what are these folks feeling? Are they feeling confused and overwhelmed? Are they excited? At every single one of these stages, there's gonna be an emotion. And it is critical to be able to capture that emotion because emotion drives action, emotion drives decision. And so what I'm hoping uh, in sharing with you framework uh, one, this empathy map, what I'm hoping to do is to reiterate, the purpose of this framework is to put yourself in the shoes of your subscriber, your customers, your audience. Again, emotion drives action and decision. And through this process, if you are able to capture all of this, what they're doing, what they're thinking, and what they're feeling, it's going to allow you to better understand their motivation and drive. And this is going to allow you to unlock the value. And by unlocking the value, you, it will be so much more clear in terms of how you adjust your content, how you adjust your services, how do you adjust your offering uh, so that it actually resonates uh, with uh, your, your audience. And so when you go through this, you're going to go and you're going to look at your existing program. You then can compare it, for example, maybe you have a program about uh, trying to convince uh, people uh, to select you, maybe under the explore and select. And if you know that your members are feeling confused and stressed, that tone, that sentiment needs to be addressed in the email that if there's an email program associated with it, that that email program, the messaging, the, the imagery, all of that needs to address that. And that's one way by going through this empathy map uh, that you're able to very quickly judge the content that you're, you're, you're sending out uh, to see if there is uh, alignment or in some cases uh, identify gaps that you're not actually addressing. Uh, there's no program and that you're not actually addressing one of these stages. At, what po at that point, that becomes an opportunity. So with this particular uh, association, event was huge for them and driving uh, people to event was really important. So that brings us to the second framework. And the second framework is the engagement uh, blueprint. Very similar to the first uh, framework, there are various stages. So in this case, there are four stages. Think about the Canadian email summit, this particular event. As part of this event, there was some awareness and there was some pre-event activity, event and you know the actual event, what's happening right now. And there will be some post-event activity. And under, underneath each of these uh, categories, there are gonna be spe specific action that's gonna be uh, happening. So, you know, the website needs to be updated. There's emails that are going to be sent out. You know, LinkedIn needs to be uh, updated to promote uh, the event. People need to sign up and pay all of these. So, again, try to uh, identify all of the various stages. The next few, uh, uh, the rest of this framework is going to look uh, uh, very messy. There's going to be a lot of information. What I want you to focus on is not necessarily the detail, the information. I want you to capture the big picture. And the big picture is this. What you're going to do first is you're going to then identify under each of these activity, what are the members action? So, you know, uh, on the website, they need to search for information. They're going to receive an email. Uh, they're going to see something in their feed. Uh, you know, if this was pre-COVID, if this was in normal time, and this was actually an in-person uh, event, they might be concerned. Well, you know, 
about finding parking. How do I get there? What's the closest TTC station, uh, station? And for that, I mean, if you're able to identify all of these various uh, activity, these micro uh, action, uh, that allows you to identify uh, opportunities uh, to delight uh, your audience. These are opportunity to make your emails more useful. So for example, maybe there is a email that is sent at the beginning of the day that provides folks with uh, parking information and uh, direction uh, because that offers them value, that, uh, that offers them utility, and it makes it a much more ideal uh, experience uh, for them. And that's what you're trying to do here. As you're mapping this out, you're trying to identify in this engagement, what is the ideal engagement? And uh, by doing that, uh, again, you will find areas uh, for uh, improvement. Now, that's just one section. But we know to make this event work, there was a lot of work that is involved. So uh, first, uh, First off, congratulations to the organizing team for the Canadian Email Summit. I know that uh, I know that this is really uh, a lot of work has been done uh, to make this happen, and we need to appreciate that. So, what is all of the work that needs to be done? There's going to be various people. There's going to be various teams. There's going to be various uh, organization. They're all inter. Uh, they're all communicating uh, together. They all have to coordinate uh, with uh, each other, and uh, there's different system that's uh, 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 you know happening uh, behind the scene that we don't even appreciate. And what you want to do here is now what you want to do is you're going to focus on connecting the members' activity, the members' action with your own action and how you need to service them. And so there's gonna be a lot of linkage. There's gonna be a lot of touch points that you will need to identify. And here's the real value of the engagement blueprint. The engagement blueprint, for you to deliver the ideal customer experience, uh, there needs to be flawless execution. And what you want to do is you want to take this time uh, to identify uh, areas where uh, there might be a chance for failure, right? So one area where there might be a chance for failure is uh, areas where there is excessive wait time. Uh, if, for example, you have two systems, a separate system that are important to deliver this experience, but they are not integrated. And it takes, you know, days for data from one system to be put into the other system so that the other system can actually deliver the next uh, stage in that uh, experience. Uh, that is excessive wait time. You know, our, our audience, our subscriber, our members, I mean, their expectation today is that it's going to be instantaneous on demand. And if you can't deliver that, you're not meeting, we're not meeting their expectation. So what we're trying to do here is identify areas of excessive wait time. More importantly, and hopefully there won't be a lot of this, what you also want to do is you want to identify potential areas for critical failure. If this were to fail, uh, the entire event uh, would, would collapse, for example. Uh, it will completely ruin the entire um, customer experience. So what you want to do here is uh, with this engagement is identify, once again, what is that ideal uh, experience? How are we currently delivering this experience? And where are the areas that we might potentially fail? And by visualizing uh, these areas for potential failure, this actually gives us a fighting chance to uh, become uh, operationally better. Uh, and these are, this is how you're going to evolve uh, your program. It doesn't all have to be content and front end stuff. Uh, a lot of innovation also happens in the back as well. And uh, and what you'll often find is when you go through this data flow, this, uh, sorry, this uh, engagement uh, blueprint, you are going to find that a lot of the wait time and uh, potential point of failure 
they are related to uh, the data flow, the data integration, which now brings us to uh, framework number three. Framework number three. If you uh, were here this morning and you uh, participated in the Homestar presentation uh, or listened uh, to that, this will look very familiar to you. And so by me sharing this framework with you again, I think validates the importance of this exercise. So what framework number th uh, three, the data flow audit, what we're trying to do here is all of the different points, uh, all the different system, uh, different points where the system's capturing data, we want to consolidate this uh, in this uh, data flow. And so what we want to do is first, this could be done in Excel, uh, it could be done in whatever way that uh, you want. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to first identify and consolidate all of the workflow. Uh, sorry, all of the, the fields. So you're going to list all of the fields here. Now what you're going to do is you're going to identify for each of the field, the source that it's associated with, the type of data it is, and most critically, the, the purpose. And when you complete that exercise, it's going to something, it's going to look something like, like this. Very, very similar to uh, uh, the Homestar uh, presentation from uh, this morning. Here's the brilliance of doing this. Once you do, uh, do more opportunities will be presented to, uh, to you. For example, there's gonna be opportunity to clean up a data so that uh, the flow will be more efficient uh, if there are duplicate uh, fields in a single database, for example, or for whatever reason, or um, data that is redundant, you can start uh, cleaning that up. It will give you an opportunity to uh, standardize uh, the information. So for example, in POSICO with the, the use case, uh, we found that it wasn't standardized and some people were using you know, this format without any uh, space and other people were using a format with space. That uh, um, without standardized data, that can impact uh, you know, segmentation and, and targeting and uh, filtering. So it's important uh, to, to standardize. It also allows you, again, to consolidate uh, information. And by consolidating information, you're going to make your data and the data flow much more efficient. But most importantly, what it's also going to allow you to do is this, this field called purpose. Every single field needs to serve a purpose. If the field does not uh, you know, serve any specific purpose that's going to aid the email marketing program, then it is uh, most likely a piece of data that you don't need, right? So what are some of the purpose that these fields should be uh, delivering? Uh, they should be related to, to personalization. Can I use this uh, field for personalization? Can I use this field for segmentation? Can I use this field for, uh, to trigger uh, uh, programs? And so what you'll see here, for example, with, uh, you know, like a membership date, start date, that might be the field that's going to trigger an anniversary uh, program. Uh, you might also need uh, these fields, uh, for example, contact ID as a unique identifier. You might need that field because you need that to uh, be pushed into a reporting uh, system. Every single field needs uh, to serve a specific purpose. If it doesn't, you know, uh, remove it. Uh, but if you go through this exercise, then what you will see is more opportunity that uh, that you might not be aware to, uh, aware of that it might be hidden in your blind spot. You know, there's a lot of discussion about big data and how uh, you know we need to uh, uh, use more big data, but by using the data that you have right now, there's a wealth of information that you currently have right now that you don't even know. And by going through this data flow audit, what you're going to be able to do is identify what you really have, the value of, of the data, and what you can actually uh, do with it. There is something right now, I guarantee you, with your existing uh, data that will allow you to um, you know, launch uh, some really innovative uh, programs. So, that is framework number three. And what we're going to do now is, oh, sorry, the deliverable for framework number three might 
you know, not only is that audit, but it might look like something like this, a data flow uh, map where you're going to identify all of your in, uh, input sources right here. So, for example, websites and tools. You're going to then, uh, from each of these input uh, sources, you're going to then be able to identify, you know, where, how are, how's the data organized, your demographic data, your membership data, your behavioral da data, other sources of, of data, because what we know is that you need multiple and diverse sources of data to be able to really do something special with your email program, right? And that in, in combination uh, together, you're, that's going to allow you to uh, reach that one-to-one -one, uh, holy grail of uh, personalization. So understanding that uh, data uh, and how they then uh, interact with the tools that you have and the campaign that uh, are being delivered, I think uh, that is going to be key. So this visualization of the data flow, where everything belongs, who's the owner of the data, how they connect, this is a living document, and uh, it's going to be very, very helpful as you try to identify, again, how do you evolve the program, how do you find uh, innovation. This is going to be a useful uh, map because it's going to allow you to very quickly identify gaps and uh, opportunities. So what we've done so far is, you know, framework number one and framework number two, which are very customer-centric of framework that's going to unlock the value. What we've just done right now with framework number three is the operational excellence. Uh, what more can you get out of the existing data that you have and how can you make it uh, um, uh, more operational for you? This leads to our final stage, which is framework number four, which is the actual strategic uh, roadmap. If you've done step one, uh, framework one, two, and three, uh, then you're, you can go straight into this. If you haven't, uh, by doing uh, uh, framework number one, two, and three, what should have emerged by now is you have now been able to identify new programs, areas for improvement for exist, uh, existing program, and areas for you to enhance your operation. With all of that ideas, with all of those concepts, you now need a methodology to actually uh, put that in place and categorize it and sort it out and prioritize so that you can make it actionable. So with the strategic roadmap, step number one is going to be the email audit. Every single email that we do, every single email that we push out will uh, deliver on one of these uh, call to action. It's either going to be an, uh, an email that's going to deliver awareness or it's going to um, uh, uh, address consideration uh, or it's going to grow or it's going to potentially, you know, reactivate. So every single email uh, program that you have, think about your email program, they're going to fall uh, uh, within one or many of these uh, buckets. Again, uh, many of your programs are also going to fall within one of these stages of maturity. Uh, some programs are, are still going to be mass and generic. Uh, most programs uh, by now will be targeted and segmented, and some programs will be one-to-one. -one. And what, we're, what we want to do here is what uh, all of your existing programs, uh, what you want to do is now you're going to put that onto this, uh, this, uh, this map. So, for example, you might have a monthly newsletter that uh, calls that, you know, that addresses all of these call to action and right now is mass and generic. Um, you might have a, an existing service reminder or win back program or early renewal pro uh, program uh, that are more targeted. And perhaps you have a very sophisticated anniversary program uh, that you're quite proud of, uh, as you should be, because it's uh, achieving one-to-one -one, a personalization. So with all of these programs, by doing the fundamentals, by doing the foundation in the earlier uh, framework, you should have now been able to identify opportunities to enhance the, these uh, programs. And that's exactly what you're trying to do here. For every single one of these programs, what you're trying to do is how do I take it to the next level? How do I make mass and generic into more targeted and segment, uh, uh, more targeted uh, program? And with, uh, you know, for example, the data audit, that's going to be a key part in allowing you to identify opportunities for you uh, to do so. 
beyond the uh, the existing program, there are going to be new programs that uh, you're going to get, you know, basic again, from doing that foundation, from doing the work, you're going to identify new programs. Uh, one of the things that you might uh, want to also do is identify, uh, for example, by quickly looking at this visual, what you see is that under nurture and conversion, there are several programs that are here, but there are, there seems to be gaps in awareness. There seems to be gap in grow and advocate. So just by visually looking at this, you know that there are opportunities. There are programs that are missing that you need to deliver. And so what are some of these uh, programs? So these are some of the new, you know, new programs that you might want to, to take a look at. I mean, these are made up of programs, but the, the point that I'm trying to make is you want to fill these gaps. There should be no white space on this, uh, this map. If there are white space on this map, you're missing uh, an opportunity to connect uh, with your audience in a meaningful uh, way. So here you go, you, uh, there might be other uh, programs that uh, you now have identified. And one of the programs that you might uh, identify might be a shiny new uh, program that you're awfully proud of, for example. So you identify your current program, you identify uh, new programs, you mapped it out. What are you gonna do now? The next step in this is you're gonna put this into uh, an assessment. So what you're going to do is you're going to list all of the program, existing and new program that you now have identified, and you're going to assess it against uh, three uh, criteria. First, you're going to assess it against effort. Uh, is this program easy for my team to deliver or hard to deliver? You're then going to assess it against value. And this is, what is the value does this program bring back to your organization? So for example, in my use case, the membership and driving membership engagement, getting more member is key. So something, a program that is gonna retain and grow uh, the membership is gonna be of high value. Anything that does not uh, uh, retain or grow the membership is going to be of uh, low uh, value. Now, optionally, what you can also do is you can also try to budget it as well. This is optional. I think it's valuable and I'll, I'll show you why afterwards. But if you can't do that, then at least try to identify the effort and the value. And what you're gonna do is for every single one of these program, for example, the welcome series, you might uh, say, hey, this is really easy. You spoke, it, uh, you spoke to your team. They said, hey, this is a really easy program to, uh, to execute. Uh, and it's going to help retain some of uh, the members. So this is of medium value and the cost is, is not going to be so great. Conversely, a VIP program might be very hard to execute. It might be of high uh, value, meaning that it will grow and retain and grow the, the whatever is going to be important for you. For example, in this, the association case is going to be members, but it's going to be awfully uh, expensive. So that's what you're going to do. Every single one of these programs, what is the effort? What is the value? What is the cost? And once you do that assessment, now what you're able to do is go into step three and you're able now to prioritize. So remember, we've assessed it against value, we assess it against cost, and every single one of your program will now be able to go, fall into one of these quadrants. So for example, with the, with the win back program, that was easy to do and we consider that high value. So it goes into this quadrant, easy, high. On the flip side, this shiny new program, it's going to be a lot of effort. And actually, in hindsight, or actually maybe not in hindsight, in, in your evaluation, it's not going to bring a lot of value. Every single one of the programs that we've identified will fall into one of these quadrants. And what you want to do here is, uh, you know, fill these out, because the next step is going to really help you. It's going to allow you now to prioritize so anything that is in green, easy, and of high value, these are your quick wins. Anything that is of average effort and of medium value, they're your next potential next win. Anything that is really hard to do, uh, but it's worth to do it because it uh, offers high value, these are your strategic projects. And anything that is of low value, and it's hard to do, well, don't even look at them. You're gonna waste your time. So don't even think about it. So once you have done that, 
what you can do now is you can now actually deliver on your roadmap. And so for every single program, for example, the quick wins, these are things that you should be considering in uh, delivering in the current quarter. That's uh, uh, your next win. Perhaps these are candidates for your next quarter. Uh, the strategic program. Well, you know what? You are going to need to find some uh, funding uh, for it. Uh, you're going. It's going to be a lot of effort. And so, what you will need uh, to do is plan for next year. And in doing so, you might also identify that. In fact, you might have to do some integration program. And so by planning it out, there might be a dependency uh, on some backend uh, data integration to support uh, these programs. But then there you have it. This is your strategic roadmap. It makes sense. It ties back uh, to uh, you know, purpose. And uh, in that way, it is meaningful. So to conclude, what have we covered? We started off with value. We did that by exploring customer journey. We did that with two uh, framework, the empathy map and the engagement blueprint. We then look at operation. We looked at the data flow because data often hinders innovation. And all we did was did a data flow audit. We found areas of, of uh, weakness that, uh, that we can now address that will allow us to move the program forward. And by doing the fundamentals, step one and step two, we were able to identify candidates that uh, we are excited to work uh, on and are and really believe in. And we were then able to put all of that into a repeatable a plan that makes sense, that is execution, uh, uh, that can be uh, executed. And they're realistic and it's achievable. And that is the strategic uh, roadmap. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And I'll take your questions. If there are questions. Man, you know me, there's always questions. <laughs> uh, I'll get us started. Um, I know you mentioned that uh, you know you were working with a uh, not-for-profit this, this summer to help sort of plan some of these events and sort of like, email triggers and, and events with them. Um, you know, assuming you're a company that has these already, right? Is there a roadmap that you would say, you know, can you follow the same strategy to say, I need to go and revisit? And then, or like, how would you recommend for someone who has a bunch of these programs in existence to sort of, what's that time frame look like? It's a great question. The point uh, about this, uh, what I just share with you, this methodology, this methodology that I'm sharing uh, with you is meant to be uh, repeatable. You should be doing now. How often do you do this? It's really up uh, to to you. Uh, do you do it? I think monthly is a little too much. Quarterly, I'm not sure. It depends on your organization. At least uh, annually, um, uh, in terms of going through and again going through every single stage, you need to challenge. We all need to challenge our fundamentals. We think we know our subscriber, but as as we've seen this past year, COVID changed everything. We don't know, uh, and 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 this 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 concept of empathy becomes really 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 important. What drives and motivates them before might uh, uh, might not be the same now, and so this constant feedback loop, constantly uh, engaging with your audience is going to be critical because, again, value is unlocked by by connecting uh, with them and that drives everything else that i shared with you uh, uh right now um so it's meant to be a repeatable uh process and, and do you think you know is, is survey enough should people be picking up the phone and calling their vips should maybe they be picking up the phone and calling those that are less engaged to try to figure out why like how do you determine that audience that you you want to listen to up front well, you know, this is a great question. And uh, some of the things, uh, some of it was touched upon uh, earlier. You have to, in terms of engaging with your audience there right now, there's multiple ways uh, that you can do, depending on your organization. Uh, you can do surveys. 
uh, you can uh, do panels. Uh, you there will be you know account team and account teams. You should be responsible with connecting uh, with your uh, uh, stakeholders. There's uh, a um, in uh, past uh, work with a past uh, uh, sorry. Um, organization that I worked with, you know, if you really want the feedback of some of senior uh, folks, it's very hard to just pick up the phone and ask them uh, this, uh, you know, how do you feel? Uh, what you might want to do with them is ask, invite them to be on a CEO or VIP panel that meets on a quarterly basis. Uh, they'll, it's exclusive, they'll feel, uh, you know, special, and they'll, they will be meeting uh, with other uh, senior executive and uh, it, uh, and if you can facilitate it, uh, facilitate it uh, correctly, it could be an incredibly useful uh, uh, tool for you. Great. Um, we have a couple questions come in, coming in here. Uh, so one is, how do you tackle the data flow audit when dealing with very large data sources? You know, yeah. I, I would even I would even expand on this to say if you have multiple systems, like if you have a transactional platform versus a marketing platform versus a CRM platform, um, you know how do you figure out all your data flows? And this even goes back to the conversation with Stephen around auditing your data. So how do you sort of envision that? You know, this is where uh, people are stopped in their track. So this uh, audit, this data audit. At the end of the day, forget about the data for a second. At the end of the day, let's take a look, simplify everything. Let's first name the system. So, you know what, I'm not gonna go back to the presentation. You have a bunch of system. You're gonna ask yourself, again, forget about the data. You're gonna ask your, this system that, uh, or this tool, what is the purpose of this tool? How does it connect or not connect with any uh, other tool? If you start going into the data, the nitty gritty of uh, the, the data, for example, the consolidation and, 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 and all of that, you're gonna get lost. The truth of the matter is that if you have such a complex uh, data set, you probably have uh, a dedicated team that is already uh, doing uh, that work. Um, so, uh, to the question, how do you address a uh, complex uh, data set? Uh, this, I know this is not going to satisfy uh, or not a satisfying uh, answer, but you really try to simplify it. Get out of the weeds, take a big picture view of, okay, this data set belongs to this tool. What is the purpose of this tool? And one of the things that you might find is that you will have two or three tools doing the same job, doing the same thing. And that gives you an opportunity to consolidate and to streamline. Great, yeah, no, that that's I would say is is something that I've seen over the years too. Like even um, working with clients to do, you know, set up authentication and such. You know, oh, we only have a few email platforms, and then you turn on the authentication, and all of a sudden, it's, oh, we really have fifteen email platforms doing fifteen different things for us. So, I can appreciate that answer and and how complicated that process is. So. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. Like one piece at a time, right? Even yep. simplify it down to that is, is one piece at a time. Start there, figure that out, move to the next one, move to the next one. By the time you're done, you should have a pretty accurate data flow. Um, another question. Um, how would you determine the data we should collect? So this is more around what should you be asking for? Um, at the point of data collection, like what what do you think? Sure, I have uh, an opinion. Uh, <laughs> I certainly have an opinion as a privacy professional, uh, but as a marketing professional, I'll defer to you. On as this. a marketing professional, well, th your opinion is probably going to be similar to my opinion, and that opinion is this: people don't want to give their data, right? So they're not going to uh, share that data freely. And uh, if you're asking for a lot of data, you know, uh, uh, it might not be entirely accurate as well, right? So to the question, you know, the strategy is, you know, for, and I think the question was specifically on a sign-up form. 
well, what is the purpose of a sign of form? You want to capture that person as quickly as possible. Make it as easy for them, um, as easy for them as possible. Asking them a whole bunch of questions or filling out a feel, a feel, a bunch of feel will not you know, be a very successful uh, technique. So the question that you want to ask is going back to, to that data audit, going back to the purpose. Every point, data point that you want to collect should serve a purpose. So you're going to ask yourself, do I need data? Do I want, you know, do I need data to personalize? What data do I need to, to personalize? You need to capture that. Do I need data for segmentation and, and, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, for segmentation? What kind of data do I need for segmentation? You want to capture that. Do I need data for reporting purposes? You know, I, I, I'll, I'll, need, uh, I'll need that. Obviously, do I need data for uh, compliance and permission? Uh, you'll need that. So for example, you know, with a simple sign-up form, all you really need is probably an email address. And what I would also recommend is a postal code. With the postal code, you could do a lot. Uh, you can gain a lot of insight and for a lot of insight from the FSA. And just those two pieces of information, you can then begin your progressive profiling uh, campaign where uh, over time uh, you collect uh, more uh, relevant information to enrich the data that uh, you have. But the main point is every single piece of data needs to serve a purpose. And if you cannot justify that purpose, do not collect that information. It's actually gonna be just a liability for you. Awesome, thanks very much, Min, for your time, for your presentation. There was lots of great comments.